Well, hello everyone. Um, um, welcome to another developer meeting. Um, every three months we have these developer meetings, and it is now three months since the last one, and it's January, and so therefore we're having one. Um, we've got uh, a number of uh, people here to talk. We've got uh, an agenda, which is on the Moodle Docs uh, page. If you search for Moodle Developer Meeting January, you'll probably find it. So we're going to go through that agenda pretty much. Uh, I don't think I'm talking very much, so, um, and I should probably get that up in front of me too. Who is first up? Ah, uh, yeah, Tim oh, is yeah. first up, but he's not in yet. He said he might be a bit late. We will have to delay his his item. The agenda. Right. Um, Sam, do you want to kick us off? A bit of uh, chat about condition. You work on conditional activities. Yeah, that's right. Um, I've actually got a PowerPoint. Um, let me see if I can screen share it. It says hopefully. Oh, gosh. Uh, right, let's see if this works. Oops, I believe I've just managed to share a PowerPoint. Can anyone yeah, see that? I can see it. Yeah. Brilliant. So just quick, I want to just uh, quickly, if, in case anyone's watching who doesn't know what conditional availability means, uh, it's about how you restrict access to activities, depending on all those things listed there, such as date. And I am supposedly the maintainer of this area, although recently I've not done all that much except respond to bug reports and uh, sort of say to people, yeah, go ahead and develop that and I'll code review it for you. But uh, I am proposing to actually do some work in the area, hopefully for Moodle 2.7. Um, this hasn't yet been approved by the OU, as in I don't yet have confirmed that I can do this, but um, I'm quite hopeful that I am, so if I could uh, touch the uh, wood-shaped area of screen, then maybe it will actually happen. So the basic summary for changes is, um, at the moment, the conditional availability only works with AND conditions. So for example, let's say you put date condition and you put a grouping condition, then somebody has got to be in both that they've got to meet both the date and the grouping condition. You can't say you've got to either belong to this grouping or it's got to be after that date. So there's no support for all conditions at the moment. So basically that's the kind of key thing, like to add support for all conditions. Also, obviously, Boolean not and the ability to sort of nest conditions so that you can ever, you know, basically make it as complicated as you feel like. Then the other changes I want to make as well, uh, at the moment, each restriction is sort of hard-coded. So in other words, there's specific code in the main library about, say, date conditions. So I'd like to make those pluggable instead so that uh, people can make up new conditions without having to change the core code, basically. Um, the interface sucks, so I'd like to make it suck a bit less. Um, there's also some confusion about grouping, which I'll come to in a minute. And uh, in the process of doing this, I think we can reduce some database tables, get rid of some fields, and uh, it should be possible to do all this um, and keep it 100% backward compatible so that it just updates, uh, you know, from your Moodle 2.6 to 2.7 or whether at least this goes in without any uh, difference in behavior. The thing I mentioned about groupings, um, this bit of a niche area, so some people might not be aware of it, but basically groupings currently are used for two things. So one is if you've got a grouped activity, like say a forum, um, you can select which list of groups to use. So that could be that you've got different types of groups. So for example, you might have tutor groups and you might have groups to do with people in different areas or different countries. And for certain forums, you want to split them in country and for certain ones, you want to split them in tutor groups. So that's one use of groupings. And then the other use is to restrict access to an activity which for which you have to use this uh, it's currently still an experimental feature, although it's worked for about five years, called group members only. Um, and there's sort of a slight issue of the way these works, which is that the group, the grouping option is in the groups section, which totally makes sense for the first, um, for the list of groups for groups activity, but it doesn't make so much sense for restricting access where you'd expect it probably to be in the restrict access section. So basically I'm proposing to um, sort of do that, get rid of group members only, and sort of automatically convert all of the existing um, things we've got a grouping set to sort of add a restrict, a standard restrict access thing on grouping. So it should allow us to sort of remove the sort of stupid option and some stuff there. Right, so the main thing about the changes to it, so this is a current interface for restrict access. Um, this is when you haven't even set any um, restrictions. So this is just the default on the form and I feel it's a little bit bloated. So what I'm proposing is this one, which is, um, if you can't work out my pictures, it's supposed to be lean and mean. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, and I was thinking more sort of dense and beautiful. <laughs> Very good. Um, anyway, so basically, it starts off just saying there aren't any access restrictions. You've got a button to add one, and that will be a JavaScript Ajax type button. So you click the button, you'll immediately be able to choose from a menu or a dialogue which type of restriction you want to add, and then you'll get a restriction like this one. So um, just immediately in this, you can see basically the grade, this is it. I've, let's assume they clicked add and then they picked grade. So you can see it's pretty much the same as the current one in terms of how it actually displays a grade condition. Um, you've got a few, so you've got X, so you can get rid of the condition, and you've got that must drop down. It's because you can do not conditions, so you could switch it to must not. Uh, I don't really want to go into detail about the interface, because really this is just a sort of, to let you, people know that I want to do this. So here's an example of the complicated interface if you had set a really difficult condition. So in this one, we've got a top level condition where it's got to match all of the following. And then there are three things, one of which the bottom one hasn't been set up yet. The other two is they've got to have a certain grade and then the next one is a nested or condition. So they've got to either be in the maths department or the media studies department. So that's a kind of, well, that's probably quite a stupid example, but you could have other other ways of combining conditions. So you could say, for example, either it's got to be this date or you've got to be in a particular grouping or something like that. So I haven't covered um, the complicated stuff. I do have a really detailed spec, but I want to wait until um, the people here are sort of all right with it. <laughs> and there's a high certainty that I'm actually going to be able to, allowed to develop it. Um, but I hope that people you know, in the Moodle community are going to like it, because basically there's um, there's a bunch of tracker issues about this, particularly every so often someone reports another duplicate of the you can't do or conditions problem, which is really the main one. Um, but also, I think um, by splitting out these uh, different types of condition into plugins, I think that will improve code quality as well as meaning that we can have, obviously, it'd be easier to add other features. So if somebody wants to add um, you know, a condition on something else or even a local one, then they can go ahead and do that. And that is, I believe, the end. So I'll see if I can stop screen sharing. Thanks, Sam. Sam that's, that looks pretty cool at first uh, blush. Really, really nice. And uh, in the chat, some people were asking about, uh, um, had some questions. So I'll let them, I'll let you deal with them. I suppose, suppose you can see the chat. Um, well, can I? Can... Oh, but the first one would be, what's the, the tracker issue for that? Well, there isn't a tracker issue just yet because well, basically, I haven't got around to filing one. I mean, there are, there are loads of tracker issues for all of the individual things, which I've sort of, I know which numbers they are. I've made a list. So I'm hoping to, um, uh, I'll, basically, I'll file one, but I'm sort of waiting for the um, go ahead that we're actually going to be able to develop it, which I should get soon, I hope. If anyone doesn't like it, they should say so now or forever hold their peace. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'm, I'm two two thoughts that come to mind for me in seeing this is it's going to be a really beneficial thing. Um, Total currently relies on conditional things uh, to, to achieve its sort of um, outcomes completion, and um, we've been looking at that recently as well at Moodle HQ. Um, one one thing I would um, looking at your fabulous forms, which look like a real improvement because they're a bit of a, a dog at the moment, like you say, um, would be to keep in mind accessibility. That's going to be quite a task to try and have something logical that still works for people on alternate browsers. Yeah, just to say on that, I have thought about accessibility and there's a brief mention of it in my spec, so I'm going to um, hope you do it. But this is going to be, I, th I think I'm correct in thinking that we don't need to make a non-JavaScript version. So as long as it's accessible, it can still rely on JavaScript uh, in 2.7. Is that... Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's good. Great. Um, but you should also, you need to check also now on two base themes uh, to make sure it's um, looks and standard still for, and uh, you clean bootstrap base uh, yep. so it can be responsive. Yeah. Yep. I, I was just wondering if it's, uh, if there's parallels with uh, the plugins that we've got for badges for rewarding badges, and uh, actually, I was just about to log into Moodle to <laughs> remind myself of what the the criteria you you can add to to open badges. I mean, yeah, you know, like I think there might be some similarities between the two. But yeah, Tim just wrote on this chat uh, that. Uh, 
I thought badges used conditional activities, uh, and that yeah, that might be the case. <laughs> and, I don't actually know either. I'll have a look at it, but that there are some sort of specific requirements. Basically, this stuff has to be quite high performance because it tends to run on every single page because it is used for the navigation blocks. So I don't, well, you know, depend if there is existing stuff, it would depend on how um, sort of quick it is and stuff like that. But also, obviously, I need to be able to reproduce exactly what the current system does before we add bits. So I don't know, but I'll have a look at the badges stuff. Thanks. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, one uh, thing I thought we could do before we move on to the the next item, and Tim is here now, so he can sort of take over from me in a second. Um, but I'd like to ask everybody who's uh, listening uh, or, or watching this, and who's in the developer chat, um, to please say hi. And uh, this will probably take a couple of minutes, but we won't we won't pause while that's happening. But just a bit of a roll roll call if everyone wants to say hello there and. Maybe where they where they're from, um, and then while that's happening, I'll um, I'll hand over to uh, to Tim. So I guess that unmutes my microphone. Hooray! Um, hello from me. I'm sitting about five meters away from Sam. Um, so. I can't remember if I've mentioned what I'm about to talk at at a previous developer meeting, but these are some changes to the quiz setup, mainly to the quiz setup page. Uh, shall I see if I can share my screen? Ooh, which of these buttons mean share screen? Hmm. One with the green arrow. Okay. The don't quite see that. Right, that looks like a browser window. There we go. Right, that's very boring, but that's the tracker issue where we're tracking this. Um, and as you can see, we've broken it down into a lot of subtasks. Joint effort between Mahmood and Colin and myself. Um, there are some peripheral bits um, like the some changes to the question bank, like how you make a copy of an existing question with some small changes, and some of these small changes we're about to push into integration. Well, that one has been integrated this week, fingers crossed, being integrated. Um, the other bits, uh, we have some mock-ups. Um, so it, it's about the edit quiz page, where you add questions to a quiz. And the only one that's really going to be visible to students is this one. Here's a mock-up of a quiz page. Um, we're just going to allow you to put section headings in the question navigation. So you know, if you have a long quiz, students can find their way around a bit more easily. The other things are mostly behind the scenes. Uh, where's my next mock-up? Uh, that's roughly the quiz editing page. Um, so as you can see, obviously, if you're having section headings, you need to be able to add them and edit them. The other thing, um, what the hell are we doing? Right, yes, of course. Um, we want the option, sometimes you have a linked sequence of questions, and you ask question one, and you get the students to give an answer, and then you want to ask question two, and the, the only way to ask question two is going to give away the answer to question one. So to be able to do this, we want the option that students can only attempt question two after they've attempted question one. So you can link sequ sequences of questions into a sort of strand that you have to work through in order. Slight risk maybe we're duplicating the lesson, but I don't think we are really. I think it's worth adding this to the quiz. Another thing is at the moment with random questions, you can randomize um, you can randomize an individual question, but sometimes what you want to do is you want to have a whole sequence of questions with the same random choice. So maybe you have some questions about frogs and some questions about toads. And for question one, you want to randomly pick either frog or toad. And then for questions two, three, four, or five, you want students to get the same random follow on question. Yeah, the same, the same thing. All, either five questions about frogs or five questions about toads. So that's this sort of yellow bit here. Um, not sure if it, I mean, it's very hard to actually get all this. So not this may change in development. But so you, you have a sort of sequence of, in this case, there are five choices. And if you get this 
question this question eight then you'll get the following question nine question ten um, and so on and the third one sounds very weird when you first hear it but um, is actually very good if you're having a quiz you know for students to practice you have the option that in a practice quiz if the students done a question and got it wrong they can just immediately say well and it give give me another go at this question and when and when the question has random variants say a calculated question when they have another go at another question you know another another question give me another question too i want to try again um it picks another random variant so um where you have a quiz designed to let students practice you know at the moment if they want to have another go at question two they have to finish the entire quiz attempt start a whole new quiz attempt and um, that's not what we want. It sounds really weird, but we've had this feature in another assessment system for some years, and it's really useful when you want to use it. So basically, we have this quiz edit page that's already very complicated. We're adding even more stuff into it, and so as well as um, just sticking this new stuff in, we're also kind of hopefully starting from scratch on this page and building something that overall is easier to use um, while adding these new features. So we're also thinking about usability as we do this. Um, and we're obviously trying to steal a lot from the way you edit the course page because you know, building a course as a sequence of activities and a quiz as a sequence of questions, there are some similarities. So let's try and give users familiar idioms and the changes in the course page in Moodle 2.6 are pretty good so that's kind of, you know other things being equal we want it to work like the course page um, I hope that makes sense so I say there's the tracker issue um, should I put that in the text chat assuming no one else has and there's a related forum thread from quite a long time ago where we talked about the ideas that's linked from the tracker issue. And the tracker issue has lots of UI mockups and lots of linked issues in an epic. So hopefully that gives people enough information about what's going on. Um, we weren't, our, our current work in progress is a real building site. So we weren't brave enough to actually show it because it's not very helpful yet. But that was actually a question I had with prototype.moodle.org or .net or whatever it is. Would we be able to put our stuff there when we have something ready to show? You know, is that available to people outside HQ if they're proposing something for core? I hope I hope we can. Yeah, I mean, right now it'd be uh, for trusted people for sure. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Um, in, it's only sort of a temporary site right now. The plan is to make it something um, where it can. Um, we can securely open up new sites without, at the moment, kind of yeah. everything's sort of in the same place. So, mm. but sure, that's no problem. I, I would hope Great. eventually that once a developer has a branch in Git, you can sort of spin up a, 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 a prototype site from that quite easily and let people try it. You know, that would be the yeah. where we are aiming at. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're in the process of rewiring all of our um, systems with uh, LDAP. All the LDAP controlled, so we can do some cool things there. But that's that's cool. Uh, so there's one question in the text chat from uh, Tomek. Um, the dependence, the dependency, is defined within a particular quiz, um, and we've decided thinking about the user interface, you'll only be able to let say question two depend on question one. You could imagine a theoretical thing where to answer question 10, you have to have answered questions 3, 7, and 9. But we decided that would be crazy. We'll just, you can sort of put a link from one, one question to the next, and that's within the, this quiz. So I hope that makes sense to people. Uh, actually, I've got a question, Tim. I was pleased to hear you say you're working on usability. and um, so Something I hear a bit is the quiz can be a bit daunting. And one of the examples is something like the close question type, um, which still requires people to type quite arcane things to do yeah. that question. Is there, is there any work either from you guys or the community in making nice GUIs for that stuff? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. Not a GUI for close, but just in the autumn, we released a new add-on question type called the combined question type 
which is kind of a re-implementation of close but with a better editing form and but also it's 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 kind of it's kind of what we want um, okay. you know so, so it, it uses all the other OU add-on question types it doesn't use many of the standard question types but actually it's also designed in a more pluggable way so in theory any question type can 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 by implementing an extra interface can Add itself to a make itself available to the combined question type. Um, so that's quite cool. Uh, so, so right now, though, if someone wants to do a lot of closed question types, there's no. They're no going to have to learn the syntax, yeah. Um, and to that, that, that would be a really with, nice um, project for a Google Summer of Code student. Well, can, it yeah. might be, but the trouble, the trouble, there are other issues with close, like the accessibility. Um, and if you want to do significant work on close, there are a lot of questions out there. You'd have to maintain backwards compatibility. So I guess that was one of the reasons we went for our own new question type, because um, we could start from scratch in a way that made sense to us. Um, okay. So well, if it allows the sorts of questions people want, then great. So yeah. I'll have a look at that one. I haven't seen that yet. Thanks. Another thing, um, we're not quite ready. You can have a sort of pre-announcement. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Uh, No. Oh. No, I can't think of the URL off the top of my head. Oh, yes, I can. That'll do. Maybe. Um, my colleague Phil Butcher has just made, just publishing, in the process of publishing a course about writing quiz questions, particularly for formative assessment, and you learning our starting with the standard Moodle questions and then going on to some of the OU add-ons. Um, we'll be sort of probably announcing that more widely next week, but um, hopefully that's a useful resource to people. Um, we're going to put it in, um, obviously, Moodle.net as well. Um, so anyway, I just thought I'd give you a sneak preview of that because um, it's quite cool. And I proofread it. It seemed good to me. Okay, cool. Uh, actually, just to finish the combinable one, are you planning to add the combinable code to the core question types? Um, or is that something that um, you put out there for the community? We haven't because, for example, we've added it to our variable numeric type, which is sort of, again, like calculated question, but we've by not having to be backwards compatible, we've built something we think is nicer. And because we've got that, we, th we actually think it would be confusing to add it to the standard numerical type, possibly. Unless maybe, I suppose, you could build an admin interface that says, you know, although the code's there, which of these question types do you actually want to be combinable or something? So basically, we to optimize the interface, we've only added it to the, to the, to the minimum set of question types that gives us the functionality we want. But, you know, it's a public API. If someone else wants to implement it for other question types, they can. Well, I just meant, I mean, you know, I understand from the OU point of view yeah. how that works, but uh, as the maintainer of the quiz module in Core, also Core should oh, also yeah. look, look, look quite nice. So may, is, is it maybe a matter of uh, in, integrating some of those OU modules in Core? That, that's a good point. That's something I've been thinking about, um, and particularly the ones I would add first are our four drag-and-drop types because they're, they're really nice, really quite easy for teachers to understand and use. Um, the main blocker there is they don't work on Android phones um, because of a UE bug that Andrew Nichols, I mean, Colin found this bug deep in the UE code and then talked to Andrew Nichols, who's on the case trying to get UE to integrate the fix. It's a sort of simple one-line fix. Um, I think once that fixes in and these do work on basically all browsers we can test on, then I think that's a strong candidate to add those. Um, some of the others, I mean, I I would really like to hear feedback from the community, from partners, you know, of these question yeah. types that are currently sitting in Contrib, which should stay in Contrib and which belong in Moodle Core. So, and you know, I don't I mean, really want to be me. To yeah. yeah. I, I don't want it to be me pushing, you know, you know, it's very easy for me as quiz maintainer to shove this in. I'd rather do it in response to, you know, requests from the community. So, yeah, I think that's a conversation we should have, but someone, yeah, I suppose, someone should facilitate it. Something to start up, yeah. No, just yeah. a thought. Cool. Thanks. Very interesting. Uh, any other questions from anyone? 
uh, Damien's just made the point. Drag and drop's tough on screen readers. Um, uh, they, there is keyboard alternatives to everything, yes. Don't know what we do about screen readers. And again, that might be a conversation to have with the Moodle accessibility folks. Towards the lesson activity. Uh, Tim, are we not going towards the lesson activity? Um, it's almost similar to what lesson do now. Well, the trouble with lesson is that it's completely unloved. Or, or, you know, or at least no one's had the resources to work on it for a very long time. I'd love to see someone take on the project of converting lesson to use all the question types from the question bank. Uh, but I'm afraid I can't see myself ever having time to do that. Well, I, I, I'm just wondering if, if we go with this uh, solution, there's mm -hmm. no need of lesson to be there anymore and it can retire because it, it basically do after this patch or after this enhancement, everything is going to be similar to what lesson do. And uh, quiz is more powerful than what lesson is right now. I still think there is something lesson does that you can't do with the quiz even after this. Um, and so the best outcome would be for someone to really take on lesson and build a really good module for building that kind of sequence of linked sort of yeah, linked sequence activity where you choose your path. I, but I, yeah, I, agree. I can't, you know, it's clearly never going to happen, so maybe it's only ever going to happen in Contrib um, or something. Well, we, well, yes. we have discussed it a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, I, I, mean, I, I would say that, I mean, it'd be good if, if there could be more of a distinction between what Quiz and Lesson are doing, and if we can shift some of the, the things that people are doing in a summative way, uh, that sort of assessment stuff from lesson to quiz and then just yeah. allow le lesson to focus on the formative assessment. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, and you know, over the years it's become easier to use questions elsewhere and it's even documented. I just put the link in the chat. You know, if someone wanted to convert the lesson to use standard question types from the question bank, it shouldn't be too hard. And, you know, last summer we had a Google Summer of Code student who built an act? You know, built the question practice activity using the question bank. You know, it's it's quite doable. Um, well, and the, the bigger question for lesson is the U, the UI needs uh, overhaul. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah we exactly. Probably, we can all imagine a flowchart type thing where you draw yeah, lines. Between yeah, 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 absolutely. If only, uh, you know, yeah. it's not, it's, it'd be a one year project for someone. You know, for the right developer, it'd be really cool. But you know, it's a huge commitment. Uh, anyway. Uh, if, 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 if someone out there wants to step up to that, you're very welcome. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to just keep working on uh, increasing funding to that outer onion ring. OK, well, shall I stop screen sharing um, if I can? What's the magic? Oh, I've done it. Right, cool. that was easy. OK, thanks. thanks. Good. Uh, well, next up on the list, uh, we've got Moodle 2.7 progress. Um, oh, we have uh, a bunch of uh, people talking about different things. Um, first up, and I already kind of we already mentioned it a little bit, but um, I suppose you've mostly all seen the uh, prototype.moodle.net, uh, which is not a, a major thing, but it is, um, I think, a good step forward. I'll just put it up on the screen. Um, so we have a site um, where we can now share prototypes. Um, before this, uh, we, we had a lot of prototypes that people were running themselves and then sharing, and that, that means there's a lot of different uh, navigation and uh, security required. Um, but um, we've had some pretty very good feedback, actually, on the ones that are already out there. And um, that's definitely informing um, the kinds of they're thinking on, on different things. So uh, there's one on navigation in uh, the clean uh, bootstrap-based thing, um, where uh, actually we were talking about some of the difficulties with the navigation block. Now, those of you who've been here for a while remember that the navigation block was originally um, invented as a way to bring all the little pieces of, inv uh, of navigation back into one place. Um, but in many cases, having all the navigation in one place is not very usable uh, or accessible um, for everybody. So uh, the, the prototype will show, shows a few options for, that we're looking at to simplify that. 
Uh, there's one on outcomes. The, the, uh, we've got the outcomes code from Moodle Rooms that's being evaluated still. Um, the, the key things with outcomes is that it needs to uh, integrate with assessment um, and it also needs to eventually integrate with higher level things such as uh, you know, full learning plans and that kind of stuff at a very high level. So for each user, you want to keep track of where they, what they, what they know, what they don't know, um, and have all of that managed, perhaps at a, in a corporate way, um, for a whole organisation. Um, so this all has to dovetail together. So we're just looking at the whole thing from top to bottom and making sure that everything's going to work together. Um, uh, there's uh, forum anonymity. There's one uh, smaller thing here about making forms anonymous, which is one of the very big, highly requested features on the tracker, um, but um, part of many other forum things. And there's an editor comparison, which will be talked about later. Uh, so that's it. Um, like I said, uh, currently it's a pretty basic site. We're just giving uh, people access to it with SSH public keys, but um, eventually it will be a much more an LDAP control thing and we'll, we'll have lots and lots of sites here and uh, it would be really nice if we could automatically pull from Git branches and so on and so on. So uh, I'll get off the stage and hand over to, um, first up, Jerome's going to talk about the clean theme and uh, a number of stuff going on there. So is Jerome there? Hi. Do you hear me? Sure. Okay, so uh, why uh, we started to clean as default uh, is because uh, Moodle uh, is limited on the current uh, default theme standard uh, for mobile. So the solution uh, to make it work well on mobile was clean. So I'm going uh, to present uh, what we need to do and what we think we need to do uh, to put uh, clean uh, as default. So first we need to resolve the, all the bugs that are related to clean and uh, we already started and we've got about 30 more to go. Then there is a question that uh, should we uh, hide uh, the standard theme on French install or should we move uh, some theme into a Moodle.org plugin repository? So I invite you to go on uh, issue. Yeah, that is it. I, I will pass uh, the link into the chat for it. So you can click on the link. So you get access to the presentation. Then uh, it was suggested uh, we should uh, also add some custom customization settings uh, into the UI to, uh, to set stuff for clean, so like a logo or colors, background colors, and links colors. And all that, uh, we conclude that we will need uh, to get, uh, to compile less in PHP. And if we can do that, we can use less in plugins. We thought as well if we should migrate to Bootstrap 3. So if it looks like a good idea, we, we thought that uh, it would not be possible for 2.7. It would be a bit uh, short time. So maybe we will implement uh, some uh, issues that will accelerate uh, the transition to Bootstrap 3 later but we don't think it's going to be possible for 2.7. So we thought as well about uh, implementing a new navigation system, which is in a prototype, you can have a look. And uh, we thought as well that we need to have a clean, user-friendly for mobile 100%, so the main things that we need to do, it's blocks great book editor. We talk about uh, the element library. We, if you were at the Hackfest, we already uh, talked about uh, the element library. It was done by Tutera. So it's a great tool uh, for a theme developer. 
then we will need to work on a team developer, probably uh, do more quick start, remove what concerns tender and other stuff. It's right an issue. And uh, finally, uh, we talked about the improved integration with Bootstrap Class for 100% compatibility with Bootswatch. So at this moment, uh, some uh, elements like file picker, file manager, editor, they don't have Bootstrap Class. So if ever you want to use Bootswatch theme for Bootstrap, they are not going to work 100%. Uh, I can do a quick demonstration of that. So here we are on a prototype site, and we are in uh, administration, appearance, theme, and is it a uh, theme created by Fred? And here we added the Bootswatch theme settings to let you uh, switch between Bootswatch uh, theme. So basically, you put uh, the CSS and less file from Bootswatch, and you can have like a sub theme into your theme and you can select a, a new theme. And so it's great for a theme for uh, changing uh, all the bootstrap theme and at, with the addition of the custom uh, settings you could greatly uh, set uh, the theme of your uh, site without uh, being very technical. And what I was talking in the previous problem, you see here the file manager and the editor looks okay, but if I switch back to another swatch, you can see that they, they look a bit odd in a team because it's a don't have a strong class. That's it. So it's all what we talk about, uh, and finally, here you've got the main document for our study that you can have a look. So I invite you to look at all these issues if you're interested and uh, participate to the discussion to this issue. That's all. Thank you. So I give you back the. Thanks, Joe. Um, well, you guys might just keep on going right through. I don't. Uh, but that's. Uh, is, there's a question actually in chat. I think it's asking more about the less compiling. We all have uh, our own scripts for fixing the bootstrap. Um, when we do mergers and cherry picks, especially in integration. But uh, yeah, it is a pain. OK, well, I guess we'll keep going because if we wait for the lag, we're going to have massive uh, four minute, five minute gaps in between. Um, uh, so, uh, Damien, editors. <laughs> So um, we, one of the other projects uh, that you would have seen, um, well, it was listed on that demo site, that the prototype.net that Martin showed. And that was this um, editor for Moodle 2.7. So um, the reason that we started this is because TinyMC2 is, um, uh, TinyMC3 is now out of support. Um, and there are cherry picks going back to it, but it's uh, not being actively worked on. Um, and I think it's only really super critical things that they're even changing anything on now. So we need to uh, move on from that version of TinyMC3. Uh, TinyMC4 is not backwards compatible with TinyMC3. Um, they've changed a lot of things, and so at this point we have to do a, a bit of work to move to TinyMC4, so um, we uh, are looking around to pick 
the best thing, um, and whether that's Tiny MC4 or something else was something that we wanted to think about rather than just accepting the default. Um, there's some other reasons that we wanted to have a look at it, and the other one is that um, the text editor is a, a critical part of Moodle, and um, whether that works nicely or not has a huge impact on the user experience for uh, students and teachers using Moodle. Um, it's used on every activity, it's used on all the settings pages. Um, if the text editor is uh, not nice to use, then that affects everything about Moodle. So um, it really is important. Uh, some of the other things that we looked at um, early on uh, was basically we have to choose something that's got a license that's compatible with Moodle, so GPL or compatible. Um, no weird back-end dependencies like ASP. Uh, it's got to be accessible, both uh, producing accessible text and also the interface for entering text has to be accessible. Um, it's got to have active support and it's got to match our list of supported browsers. So we um, looked at a whole bunch of different editors and based on just those very simple critical requirements, we chopped uh, a lot of them out very quickly. Um, and we were basically left with three main contenders that looked realistic. Uh, one was TinyMC4, one was CK Editor, and the other one was Atto. So Atto is the text editor that um, came from uh, some work that I did after looking, seeing some posts on a discussion forum. Um, so it's basically a content editable text area um, with all the buttons built by UE and all the interaction built by UE. So it's, uh, it's in the plugins database now. Um, and we did briefly think about adding that to Moodle as a second option for a text editor for 2.6, but we pulled it back out, um, which is probably a good thing because I think uh, we really need to think about it carefully and have a clear message about the text editors uh, going forwards. Mm. Sorry, I can't use a Mac very long. So um, what we did is we got those three text editors and we um, hacked uh, a version of each of them uh, and put it on that prototype site. Um, and when I say hacked, I mean we had most things working. So they had language strings, they were all real plugins, they loaded things via UE. Um, the only uh, kind of hacks were air bits that were just going to take a lot of work for us to finish off. So um, we just left them as they were uh, and noted that as this is going to be something we have to do later. We choose this text editor. Um, and we tried to get them all sort of about uh, on the same standing in terms of integration um, with Moodle. Uh, so we set that up and then we invited people to test them all out and fill out a survey. Um, it was interesting when we look at the results of the survey. We had about 40 odd people fill out the survey um, and a lot of those would have been developers so, uh, so that means that there would have been some um, uh, I guess teachers who were testing it, probably not many, mostly I'd say almost all of them would have been developers, so it's kind of a slightly skewed population. Um, but the developers have good opinions as well. Um, the result that came out of it was that there was no clear winner. They were all about equal. Um, some were slightly better in some areas, but on a whole there was nothing that that stood out as this one is a definite no, this one is a definite yes based on the survey data. Um, we did get a lot of good feedback about things that annoyed people about all the different editors, so whichever one we pick, we've got that list of things that we can work on to improve them before we um, release the first version. Uh, the other thing that came out is that um, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of people commenting on the maths features of the text editor. So um, in TinyMC3 we have DragMath, which is a Java applet, which uh, while the people like the interface of it, but uh, the fact that it's a Java applet is getting 
more and more of a problem because you keep getting all these security warnings and there's nothing that you can do about them. And even if you have a signed certificate, you still get security warnings. Um, and uh, the fact that people have to have Java installed is a security hole in the first place. And um, it would be nice to replace that with uh, a JavaScript version of something. Um, but uh, people do like the user interface of the drag map editor. So we can um, build something new, no matter what editor that we choose, uh, something JavaScript based that basically does the same thing. So there's one half of that is the actual editor that you use for maths equations, and the other half is how you render them. So there's the LaTeX plugin. Um, as part of this work, I wrote a MathJax plugin. I know people were already using MathJax via the adding custom um, uh, code to the header of each page, um, which is another option that they can do now. Um, I found the MathJax library itself to be really good. So um, we could possibly look at integrating MathJax as a standard way of displaying these equations. But the display of the equations is separate from the editor that we use to, 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 to create them. And that's separate from the text editor in the middle. Um, so there's sort of three separate things that we need to consider out of this. But I do like the look at MathJax. Um, and uh, some people in the community have done some work, like um, Daniel. I uh, can't remember his last name, wrote a version, um, wrote a, an equation editor that uh, gives you a library of things that you can add, uh, similar to what DragMath does, but it's all JavaScript based. And he wrote one for one of those for Pony MT3 and one for Atto, but we could do that for whatever text editor we choose. It's going to be something that we have to do as part of the follow up. Um, so uh, the only other thing that, well, the other thing that's important is the technical side of it. So when we did all these in, uh, prototypes, we found out how much hacking we had to do to integrate each one of them. And CK Editor and Atto were both fine, but TinyMC4 was a huge amount of work to even get it working. Um, and the language string integration is just horrible. And uh, for that reason, um, I think at a stage we ruled out TinyMC4, mainly on the, the base of the language string uh, uh, integration that was required. So the two remaining editors are Atto and CK Editor, and we haven't quite made a decision uh, between them. Uh, the final decision on that is up to Martin. Um, and We'll pick that very soon because we're going to start working on it um, in order to get it ready for 2.7. So um, we'll probably be working on that in the next sprint, whichever one of those we choose. Now, I can't see the chat, but there's probably lots of questions, or maybe a couple. There's a fair bit of discussion about plugins going on. Summary. OK. Are there any unanswered questions? Maybe someone could repeat that at the end. Um, I guess I guess just the point that's being asked is, you know, uh, will, will the plugins that are being created need to be updated? Yes. Um, no, matter what we choose. Yeah. Either if we choose TinyMC4, none of the TinyMC3 plugins we tried worked. TinyMC4. So whatever we choose, uh, people are going to have work to do um, on their text editor plugins. So um, I would, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you honestly what, where my head is at at the moment, and it's that we we kind of need a simple editor that's very standard, and for 90 plus percent of people, really, that's all they're ever going to need. Um, if you go to any other website on the internet, you don't get fancy editors with three rows of, of, of buttons. Um, you, in fact, very often you get no buttons at all. You just have a text a text box. Um, so we were trying to fix that in the last uh, editing or the last tiny MCE revision with having a simple and a complex flip toolbar switch there. 
Um, but really, uh, most people really don't need most of those. So, I mean, one way forward is to have Atto as the core default editor and to also support CK Editor um, with all its huge community of plugins. Uh, as a, but, but perhaps it's uh, not in core, but it's in the plugins database supported by us and the community as the full editor. Um, and uh, it should be quite easy to install both and the user can then choose because we already have all that mechanism for choosing editors which is vastly improved in recent versions. So at the moment that's where my head's at but it's not fully decided yet. The thing of choosing Addo is it's going to cost a lot of money um, to not just Moodle HQ but um, to the Moodle community in a way. Uh, so it's a tough decision. Uh, if it didn't cost money, it would be an easy decision, I think, but it does. Um, but Atto is very clean. It's, it's Moodle code. It's clean, uh, written for Moodle. It's, it's all Moodle plugins, and any Moodle developer can quite easily get into it. Uh, whereas the other ones, you have to learn a whole different framework. And, um, it's a, obviously a toss-up. Anyone... Any other questions oh, sticking out for anyone there? Uh, was there was no cable plugin for Atto, um, which I released an update last week, which adds a cable plugin. So that's one more thing crossed off. I, um, actually, I had a look at your table plugin today, and um, it's quite nice how it has all these accessibility features like the captions and stuff that I've not seen anywhere else. Maybe I just haven't looked close enough, but. Yeah, I made this. You couldn't create a non-accessible table, um, so you can't merge cells, for example. That's that's what I like uh, about Addo particularly is that if we can make accessible, we can make it really accessible in the UI and in the code it produces by basically limiting options. Um, so we can almost force accessible code to be generated out of it, and we do it once, and it works everywhere. And I, I don't think CK Editor has quite that same focus. I know they've tried, they've done a lot of work on accessibility, but I'm not sure that's happening in the code it's producing. It's mostly in the UI. Okay. Well, that's out there. Um, the issue, uh, did you post the, we should have all the trackers Tracker items on the agenda. Someone should add them at some point. Uh, well, uh, there's no tracker for this. There's the um, the dev docs page, which I listed. The dev docs, yeah. As soon as you choose one, you'll create a tracker and all the subtasks. <coughs> which is a question from Eric about Atto. No, no, it's not licensed there. Although the cost is just developer time. It's it's going to cost us more developer time which means less work on other things. Uh, it's, it's costing money out of the Moodle HQ funds which come from partners. Yeah. And I have been talking to the accessibility group along with Martin and Andrew Nichols. Yeah, Jason, I've spoken to them as well before. And I wrote a huge post today, actually, to them. OK, we should keep moving. Uh, so Damien, uh, I think you're on next anyway. So, Yep. So the next thing I was going to talk about is that um, we got rid of assignment 2.2 in the 2.7 branch this week, or well, last week. Um, so it's gone now. Uh, there is a stub left. So if you try and restore a 2.2 backup, it will all the restore code is still there. It'll restore it and then immediately upgrade it to the new assignment module. Um, the other thing that we changed is that if you run the assignment upgrade tool now, it will remember the uh, CMID of the old assignment module and the ID that it got upgraded to. And any attempts to access the old assignment module will redirect to the new one automatically. Um, so. Uh, what this means for upgrade is if you've still got lingering instances of mod assignment when you upgrade, um, 
they'll all become hidden. And in order for you to see them again, you'll have to finish running the upgrade tool. Um, and then everything will just work. Uh, the only exception to that is if you've got an old 2.2 assignment module custom subtype that hasn't been converted to the new one yet. So if you write a plugin for the new mod assignment, uh, you have the option of adding support for upgrading from an old um, plugin type. So if there's no candidate for you to upgrade to, uh, you still have the option for running the old mod assignment in 2.7, but you'll have to basically uh, replace the whole mod assignment folder with the one from 2.6 um, as part of your upgrade. And that will go in the plugins DB as the old assignment module, in case anybody wants to get the code for it. But we won't be, uh, we'll be maintaining it on the 2.6 branch, but not on the 2.7. That minute silence, I think. <laughs> Everyone do the Moodle sign for it. Uh, okay, so is there any? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, uh, um, do you want to? Um, is Andrew here? Yes, he is. He's going to talk a bit about the outcomes, I think. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if you meant me. Yes. Yes. Your name's on the list. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, yeah, well, I saw outcomes was on there. Um, for those who haven't been sort of keeping up with the story, um, prior to the release of 2.6, there was a lot of work done to try and um, get a new outcome system from Moodle Rooms into Core um, that was ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, a lot of work was done on it, but it just didn't make it in time to the uh, standard that we were all happy with. Uh, at the moment, we've kind of gone back to the drawing board a, a little, where we're um, getting to know Tutara and Ellis and sort of looking at what they do and trying to come up with sort of a bit of a best of breed uh, system that we can put into a future version of Moodle. Uh, so at the moment, it's all kind of actually gone back from code back to more documents at this point. Um, yes, I'm not sure. Is there anything specific you want me to talk about, Martin? No, uh, that's it. Uh, that's pretty much what I already said also. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's really it. I didn't put it on the agenda, um, but it's some, it is something we're working on, so worth mentioning. Yeah, uh, um, I think probably in the next couple of days I'll produce a document with what's come out of our discussions, what I think is probably worth us adopting um, from these different systems we're looking at, um, and then we can have all have a bit of a discussion about how right I am or wrong I am, and um, try and come up with, then break that down into tracker items and start writing some actual code. Cool. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, we'll keep on moving uh, to the logging stuff, which is a rather large topic. Raj, in the yeah. back end team. I'm just representing logging on behalf of the back end team, what we have done in 2.6 uh, and now. Um, as you all know, we have a couple of issues with the the backing previously. Um, I'm just going to share the login specs now. There you go. Um, as you all know, we started this work back in 2.6 uh, because we wanted uh, some consistent behavior and good, rich information for logs and do analysis over it so it can be used and fed in different systems. Um, we started working on events uh, in 2.6, converted a lot of uh, add to log and legacy events 
which were inconsistent and not very rich and they were not reliable as well. So we converted them and we introduced Events API in 2.6, uh, um, which seems to be working very well now when we are converting the events to logs. And uh, uh, what we have done now is um, we have um, come up with a logging framework, which basically um, can reads everything from the, um, which stores the events, and then you can read and do context checks, do a lot of filtering on on the events, and show them what user wants. I'll just go straight to the demo first. So if we just in, if we just enroll users. So this is logging uh, site. It automatically gets updated with what we are doing. We have the context where exactly the event has happened, what event is happening, and who did it. Uh, at the same time, we have more information about if you are logged in as someone else or um, what level of information is retained. We have all that information in the events, which is visible here. So if I want to see the logging, what's exactly happening. I know admin user was logged in as student. He did something on the assignment with online text. And if you want more information, it's there in the event and it can be manipulated. We have more filtering levels now. We can filter the logs with the basis of educational level, which we never had previously. So now events. Uh, um, can be um, grouped together in certain uh, educational levels, which people can uh, take advantage of later. Uh, we can have uh, more of actions which are worked, defined in the event system. So we have different uh, events uh, um, uh, verbs, and they are strongly uh, guided by uh, the doc documentation and logging uh, events. So we know what kind of events can happen. We can group them together. And with this information, we, we can actually uh, go further and put this information in the LRS, uh, which, which can later be harnessed and uh, statistics can be um, gained out of it. So this is what we have done till now. Um, I'll just look at the dev chat and see what, what's going on there. Okay. That looks nice. Uh, well, the performance will always uh, be an issue uh, with the with the number of. Uh, events being captured at this point, and we have to feed and store that information. But with the new event system, we have the functionality to push it to the external database or any other uh, system, external to Moodle, and then sh uh, sharp it and do whatever we want to do to the external database, which will be faster. Uh, one thing I'd like to add that uh, better just wrote an issue about buffering of uh, records. So instead of uh, doing like 10 inserts for one page, it would be buffered. And in the end, it would do just one single insert if you're using the new standard uh, database for this standard store for the plugins. Oh. Yeah. So it will just uh, well, uh, all the events and do it. With, with, it the current, with the current uh, system, what we have is we can, we can write whatever store we want to write and divert all the information of events to that. So we don't have to worry about where the uh, event is going. So yes, you can put it to file or wherever, but it's going to be uh, slow. Where is that even pinned on? Uh, I'm just looking at the login box here. Yeah. Where is that? Uh, How do I go to this? Uh, so I want to see this window. 
One of the slowest things now is uh, accessing the log table. Uh, well, accessing the log tables is always slow. That's why what we are trying to do is we are trying to avoid any uh, usage of log tables where possible. Uh, like recent activity report, which Marina is working on, we'll try not to use and read log tables and try to have that information stored locally for recent activities. So when, when you're writing something heavily to a table, reading, reading that back is always going to be slow, like logs. It happens for everything. You view it, you create, delete, any action happening from any user is being logged. So we try not to use it when possible. And that's possible through event observers and having your own storage. So yeah, we'll, we'll try to have that optimization. Uh, yes, Sam, if you don't have anything uh, joined to log table, you can always uh, disable it. Or I, I'll suggest create your own plugin and push that information somewhere. So it can be reused, harnessed. Yeah, and it, I, I, I'm just trying to get my window back so I can show you the plugins, which, oh, it's not here. I don't know where it's gone. Put a new tab and start a new screen share. Uh, just, it's this, it's. No, it's uh, Chrome. Is it Chrome? Is it Chrome? It's not Chrome. Oh, yeah, I got it back. So we have this, and we have the plugins. It's it's a, it's logging is just next to plugins where you can disable, enable, manage your own stuff, yeah. add things to it. So you can define whether you want standard plugin, standard logs, legacy logs, external database, file, or even LRS. Some custom LRS can be used where you can push this data to some something, which which is going to be faster. It, and and with with the current event structure which we are which we have implemented, it seems to be very promising because converting a standard log or legacy log from the old one to the new took hardly a day's time. So so it's it's really promising the way event structure has come up and the data we have now. Um, I think that's enough from us. Anyone else? Do you want to add something? Um, um, that's all from the logging team. Um, if if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the dev chat. I'll pass that back to Martin. Hey guys, uh, thank you for that, Raj. Uh, I think that was good coverage of the new logging API. I think you already answered all the questions, so. Um, yeah, well, it's still a lot of work to go, and uh, we'll, we'll have to keep in touch with everyone as we go, because we don't want this to be another roles rollout, uh, 1.7. Um, uh, next on the list uh, is, ah, Juan, uh, it's going to give us a bit of an update on what's happening with Moodle Mobile. Um, uh, or maybe Tim feels his question's not answered. Um, <laughs> well, yes, let me share my screen okay. first. We'll do it on the chat, Tim. Go ahead, Juan. Okay. Yes, do you, do you hear, hear me? Yes. No? Okay, fine. So first, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Not sure if, if you see my browser. Do you see my my browser? No? Ah yes, fine. Okay, first so um we are trying to release a new version of Moodle Mobile. Uh, every month. As you can see, we release a version in September, one in October, and 
the last one in December, and this week I'm planning to release a new new version of Moodle Mobile that has some uh, bugs and minor improvements. Um, this uh, we we used to release minor versions like like Moodle, that, like uh, this one is a minor version, 1.3.1 is a minor version, 1.3.2 is it's also a minor version with minor new features and uh, mainly box fixes. So the, the next uh, version is going to be 1.3.3 that is going to have um, some bug fixes. We have some bugs regarding the new version of Android component. They are using now Chromium. Chromium. Uh, I'm not sure what they were using previously. And this change broke some, some breaks some, 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 some one of them. Also, um, I have fixed some problems regarding all Android, old Android versions. Um, the application statistics for Android shows that mm, the most used versions are Android 4, but still there are a lot of people using Android 2.1 and 2.3. So we have a little support for, for, for this. Juan, you're, Juan, you're breaking up for me. I don't know if it's just me. Anyone else? One of the new features that I think that is that. Um, Juan, we, we can't hear you. Your voice has just disappeared almost to nothing. Uh, can you hear me okay? You sort of degenerated into a nice art piece. Uh, it might be worth um, reconnecting, perhaps. Ah, here he is. Juan, try talking. Yes, uh, did you, ah, do you hear better. me now? Carry on. Yes, that's great. Carry hey, on. Sorry. You have to share your screen again, that's all. Okay. Well, um, yes, uh, uh, what, well, uh, a cube. A quick summary. Uh, I was talking that we are planning to release a new version of Moodle Mobile uh, every per month, every every month, and the next version is going to be released in a couple of days. It has some bug fixes, and also it had it has um, a new function that makes uh, that that can make the application works in, in desktop, in Windows and Mac or, or Linux, using an, an application that is called Node WebKit. And I'm this this I'm going I'm going to show you how, how this works. So it's just as you can see it's like a desktop application you open and it opens the application in as you can see. So and you can browse, for example, the course contents, and you can download a file like a PDF. And once the the file is downloaded, you can open it using the native application in 
in your computer so you can watch and also you can use the the audio camera and photo albums functionalities so you can browse your 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 files and upload a, an image to, to Moodle easily. So this may be may be interesting for people that wants to run Moodle in desktop and and also offline because you can disconnect and, and the application is going to still working. You are going to be able to view the documents you previously downloaded. And I think that this may be interesting for, 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 for some institutions with uh, limited connection, internet connection. Um, we are focusing now in, in working in the push notification system so we can we can receive push notifications from Moodle and um, we have installed an iNotifier instance that is like the the software that is going to connect a Moodle instance with our mobile devices and this is that here in message.moodle.net and it's running OK, and I'm developing the, the plugin. It's a local plugin. Um, then this. This one. This was developed originally by Jerome. And I'm I'm going to make some change in order to to make it work in the new push notification infrastructure infrastructure that that we we made and well I think that's that's all if you have any question I I'm not sure if you if you hear me well. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. I can uh, hear and see you well, but um, some others are having a little bit of problems. I think it's the usual thing with Hangouts is that after some time it tends to degrade probably in memory leaks or something. Uh, but that's really cool. Uh, the, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear though the um, NodeKit version of the app to run on desktops. Is that already available anywhere or is that um, you'll be releasing that? Like yes, well, you, you have to download uh, Node with Kit, that is like, um, uh, it's, a, it's the software that can open an applic an HTML5 application. In fact, there, there are two ways. You can, you can use Node with Kit for, for open any, any web application that is prepared to run in, web, in Node with Kit, and also you can build and package and distribute a version of, of your application. I, I just write a, a document in, in, in the wiki, or let me find it. Um. That's cool. It will be maybe nice to package it up in a Yes, let me find let, let me find the document one second. Well, I, I'm going to to uh, write the, the link in the chat because I'm not okay. sure where, where yeah, I no worries. Worries. <laughs> I a, Actually, to, if you um if you get a moment uh, to put it on the agenda, actually of the developer meeting, that'd be great. Okay. Fine. Cool. 
Um, well, thanks. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Uh, and uh, there's everyone in the chat. Mostly, it's, it's still arguing about logs. So I don't think there were any other questions apart from the uh, information about the where to find the node kit stuff. So. Uh, so we'll move on. Thanks, Juan. Uh, next up is uh, Dan was going to give a bit of an update about what's happening in integration. Some interesting stuff there. So Dan, the man. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me share my wonderful presentation. Uh, get my links up. I'm just going to paste uh, all the links for what I'm talking about into the into the chat now, so you can follow along later. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're I'm just talking about uh, a few different things that we've we've been doing in the integration team and um, thinking about. Uh, making decisions on, on, on what we're expecting from code coming into integration and that kind of thing. So the first thing is uh, the continuous integration bot, uh, which is now running uh, automated uh, checks on all issues in yeah. Was I muted then? <laughs> Actually, uh, I got kicked myself, um, so I don't know what happened. All oh, right, okay. That, I thought the, the noise was someone unmuting me, and I've just been talking away on my own no, no. <laughs> without anyone no, hearing. Everyone else seems to hear. You're good. <laughs> Keep going. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, where was I? So the yeah, the continuous integration bot uh, is something that we've been working on for a while, <laughs> Pro probably. <laughs> probably a couple of years now and always wanting to, to get it working. I've only just recently started it. So so uh, basically the idea of this is to run automated tests on your code submitted for integration uh, before the, the integrators get to do it. So it's, it's the bot side of it. So it tries to, to merge your changes and then it will run the code checker and the PHP docs checker, uh, the, the same ones that we have uh, are linked off the coding style document, and will report problems uh, if any are discovered as part of the uh, as part of your merged changes, uh, as part of your your branch. Um, and we're we're doing that on uh, three different states. So if an issue is Waiting for into integration, it will get the the CI bot will will run and run those checks. If it's waiting for peer review, it will also run on on that. And there's also a special uh, syntax. You, well, you can put in on your issue the label CI me, which I put as point number two. Uh, when you when you add the CI me label, uh, the there's a job running on our integration server, which will pick those up and, and run the code checker and, and the PHP docs checker and check how it merges. Um, one of the advantages of this it, over the running the code checker on your own is that it will only report differences found in the diff of your changes. So if you're modifying lib Moodle lib, uh, it's got hundreds of coding style violations or maybe that was one that was cleaned up recently, but most of the library files were only slowly getting there. So the, the idea is you can only you only see the the uh, the coding style issues that apply to to your to what you've changed. Um, it's still a work in progress. There's there's a few things going on. The the tracker issue is Moodle site two six six two. Uh, that's link number one. Uh, so yeah, I've seen seen a few people uh, using CI me. So they add the issue, uh, the label to their issue, and then the CI bot runs every 
it, it looks for new issues every 30 minutes, uh, I think. And just if you add that label, it will go around hunting for CIMEs and then uh, produce the report, uh, post it on the issue, and it will remove the label. Um, so, uh, yeah, so obviously the aim there is that uh, code submitted to integration doesn't have any uh, coding style issues and it merges cleanly and that kind of thing. I mean, there are, it, it's not perfect, and there's a, on that uh, Moodle site issue that I've pasted, there's a number of subtasks and there's like a suggestion from Tim, Tim Hunt to um, run shifter and uh, the less compiler uh, on the on the uh, on the issues and you know report those problems. But anyway, that's the that's the uh, first issue. The second thing I wanted to talk about was our testing requirements. Uh, so hopefully you know that Moodle now comes with two different testing suites. We've got the PHP unit tests and uh, the BHAT uh, acceptance tests which uh, use uh, Selenium to, to run UI tests on it. And we've got about uh, 300 BHAT scenarios and 10,000 steps at the moment and about 2,500 PHP unit tests and about 45,000 assertions. Um, so uh, we're, we're also picking up uh, many issues with, with the unit tests and the acceptance tests. Um, we, we in the integration team and Middle HQ think that having this, this suite of tests will re really brings massive benefits to us in stability. Uh, so our guidelines are, at the moment, any new new changes must not break the unit test suite. That's, that's a non-negotiable thing. If, if, if you end up breaking the test suite, we either fix it or revert it. So be very conscious of that and run the tests in your, the code area that you're modifying before you submit it for integration. Um, new features must be accompanied by unit tests and acceptance tests. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're adding a major new feature, you should be factoring in the time to create these tests uh, as part of your the, the scoping for your development work. And bug, bug fixes with accompanying automated tests are also strongly encouraged. Now, having said that, the reason that I want to kind of wanted to talk about it today is. Uh, these are like the guidelines, the first principles that we work from, but the reason that we've got the integration team there as humans rather than CI bot is to actually use our common sense and, uh, you, you know, apply the rules where they make sense. So if you submit code for integration which doesn't meet those guidelines, then it runs the risk of being rejected. So examples of situations where we'll be more flexible uh, new and inexperienced contributors of Moodle and uh, people who aren't sending things fre uh, frequently or when the developer has, has demonstrated an attempt to include tests but has hit a blocker outside of their control. So we'd like to see you like discuss why you haven't written tests. That, that will increase your chances of success getting through integration. But conversely, examples of situations where we'll be less flexible about these requirements are large changes. You know, if, if, if you're submitting a massive amount of code for uh, integration, well, you're effectively handing it over to us to maintain to, to some extent. Uh, and, you know, that's what we, that's what we want with it. Uh, also, if, you, if you're making a change to a code area that is already massively covered by unit tests, well, you know, you may not have had time to do it, but we've got, like, near 100% coverage on in that area, and we prefer to keep it that way. Uh, and also lack of time. L like I say, uh, 
this this should be part of 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 your estimating time for submitting code for integration. Uh, having said that about the code areas, don't we, we also want to increase our code coverage. So just because an area hasn't been tested before doesn't mean that you should avoid it in future. Uh, I'm just looking looking a bit at the chat logs. Well, I'll go on to the next next item. Uh, B hats. Uh, so point number three on my list of links is uh, an update on uh, some information on the browsers that B hat works with. Uh, recently, we've we've got B hat working very stably on Firefox, Chrome. And Phantom JS, which is a headless WebKit-based browser, which uh, runs on the command line, and you know if you're integrating with automated scripts, it's sort of nicer because you don't have a, a browser window popping up. Uh, IE is also working, but uh, not 100% of the time. There are weird edge cases, and Safari is kind of highly experimental. Uh, David would probably comment on. Uh, what what the status of that is? Um, actually, we're spending quite a lot of time getting you know David spending quite a lot of time on on sort of stabilizing the the support between all the browsers. It's you know there's quite a lot of investment going into into that. Uh, the next item on which was uh, to to make you aware of a new feature that was added uh, last week, I think, which is uh, number four on my list of links. It's config bhat underscore screenshots underscore path. Now, if you define that path, when when bhat hits a failure, it will take a screenshot and place it in the folder that you've you specified there. So that's kind of useful. Uh, there's also uh, recently Petter uh, sort of really simplified the configuration for BHAT. Uh, that was so. So originally, um, we thought that uh, running well, we made quite a lot of allowances to to stop BHAT from being used in production environments and. Kind of, there were quite a lot of switches to enable bhat in your config.php file. Now, all you need to define is a um, bhat www root, which has to be different from your normal www root. So, a lot of us, for example, have used, say, localhost uh, for for our production site or a host name like dan.moodle.local. And then used 127.0.0.1 for the uh, bhat config. Um, fi yeah, final item on bhat uh, was that is that there's some work going on to uh, parallel uh, allow. <laughs> see if I can say the word allow us to parallelize uh, the running of bhat run because, uh, as I say, there's uh, 10,000 steps at the moment. It takes quite a long time to run, uh, although it's quicker than me typing those myself. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, well, let's read the chat back. Yeah. It's not overnight, Tim. <laughs> we we're, we're running it multiple times a day. We don't have to. Doesn't always have to be overnight. <laughs> uh, yeah. Next one. So just some other bits and pieces uh, that I thought I would highlight. Um, the backporting policy. Uh, that's point number five on my list of links. Uh, the the general policy is bug fixes should. Uh, Get backported into all stable branches. Uh, so, for example, at the moment, 
your bug fix would go into master Moodle 2.7, uh, sorry, that's Moodle 2.7, Moodle 2.6.2, and Moodle 2.5. whatever the latest release is there. Uh, there are a few uh, cases that we've kind of particularly identified. Um, PHP docs only issues. So if you are if you want to fix PHP docs or add PHP docs, we'll accept fixes for all the branches. Um, but if you're adding new doc blocks, we request them on master only. Uh, the main reason is to reduce the risk of conflicts. Uh, and with testing, so for example, adding unit tests or adding features to the testing frameworks, we, we try and backport those as far as possible without being too risky. So we're, we're a little bit more um, accepting of like improvements uh, to the testing frameworks for the benefit of uh, increased unit testing and that kind of thing. Uh, next thing was the integration schedule. That's point number six on my item. Just a reminder that our, our schedule in normal operation is Monday and Tuesday we're integrating new changes. Um, and, it, you know, it, it really, if, if, if you can respond to our, any comments that we have on Monday and Tuesday, it really increases your chances of success because on Wednesday we switch to testing mode and from an integrator's point of view uh, if, if there's issues outstanding without any feedback from the developer on Wednesday that means we either reject it or uh, test it ourselves or find volunteers <clears throat> and, and also which we're aiming to always release on Thursdays and that doesn't happen very often these days uh, so if you can respond quickly to uh, our every needs, then that's good. Uh, I've talked about this in other areas. We realize it's kind of is a little bit unfair on on you guys because we have our schedule. We enforce you s sticking to it, and uh, we don't really abide to any guidelines on how fast we peer review your changes, but that's life. <laughs> uh, Freeze, uh, the integration team, I think we thought we could have frozen better last release, and uh, we're going to really pump it up again, the freeze up this release. Uh, so please get your changes in before the code freeze. Uh, we'll be less relaxed about it. And that's it from me. Reading the, I'm just going to read the questions. Um, thanks, Dan. I don't think there's any other uns unanswered questions. Um, that's a very good summary and nice slides too. Interesting. <laughs> thanks. Uh, um, the uh, the next one's a uh, I didn't put that in, but uh, long term support. Um, so. As you probably already know, we were aiming towards 2.7 being a long-term support release, and uh, that has not changed. Um, so it still is aimed to be a long-term support. Um, it's 
Uh, long-term long -term support really just means that we're not going to um, stop porting fixes to it after 18 months, which is the current policy, but to keep it longer. Um, longer being probably three years, I guess. Um, but that's not fully decided yet, and it may even change. Perhaps it's, you know, we keep it until some uh, metric happens. You know, people are uh, no longer installing it or using it or something. Uh, but it'll be much longer than the usual. Um, so, again, that'll cost us, um, but um, a lot of people have been wanting it, and uh, it's why we're doing a lot of sort of infrastructure -y type things uh, still in this release. Uh, to try and get them in for that. So um, it, it's always the case where you can always think, well, the next version would be better because then we'll have this and we'll have that and we'll have that. And it's uh, it, that happens every release, basically. So we have to just draw a line some at some point. Um, well, uh, no, because well, we want infrastructure changes so that people can build a plugins ecosystem on top of those infrastructure changes, um, uh, and we don't want people stuck in the dark ages um, for years, like 1.9. So, uh, yeah, but I do, I do get that point. Um, there probably will be increased uh, momentum on the new releases after 2.7 as well. Uh, so it'd be a bit of both. So yeah, so currently our pro, uh, just answering the question there from Eric is will will the LTS version need backports for bugs? That's that's the idea is that the um, uh, devs will be required to backport um, bug fixes to that version for some years, which is a pain in the butt, but needs to be done. I mean, a lot of people want to stabilize on that release uh, to do big projects, lots of uh, things. Uh, you know, they don't, don't want to be up, updating very often. Yeah, you, well, you know what a long term support release is. So, yeah, we're, we're going to have to have some sort of policy. I don't think we've decided yet what that policy will be. Um, is to, I don't think all the bugs are going to be possible. But right now we have the policy that all bug fixes are supposed to go back for um, the last two releases before the current one, so three releases total um, for the 18 months. And uh, not all bugs are going are actually being backported because some of them are too difficult or you know, for whatever reason. So it's a bit of a judgment call. But in general, that's what we're trying to always do, backport. Um, yeah, security stuff obviously imp very important. Um, but I would say even uh, any any data loss has to happen. Um, some if they usability problems that are being fixed in current versions and it's not too hard to backport them, then we should we should backport them. Um, so. Um, it's not a bad idea, Justin. Always throw another label at a problem. Um, but I, it's not a huge difference from our current policy. It's just the, adding one version to that that's not going to time out. Yeah, uh, I did say um, it would be uh, at least three years. Um, I think three years is probably is, uh, what, what people would really be asking for. Um, any longer than that, we'll decide when we get there, but that's a way off. Uh, okay, so moving on. Uh, next, to, yeah, the next question. Well, there's um, uh, there's some questions at the bottom, but um, and I don't know how much we can answer this. But Michael, maybe you want to just take this. Are you still there? Yeah. About a, a better solution. We really need uh, this solution's a bit odd. With its yeah. lag and all, sort of works. But so, uh, Dan, Michael. Meetings. Uh, so we're running them every three months now, and um, I guess the involvement is increasing, which is great. 
um, we're, we're also in trying to involve people outside as well and you know have the focus shift for each meeting the um, uh, the sort of uh, solutions that we've used in the past we tried big blue button and um, that was okay it was able to cater for a large group of people which was good um, there were technical problems people trying to get in uh, didn't work very well under Linux and screen sharing was rather poor and um, the recordings also were a bit problematic and we couldn't capture them for for uh, you know long-term records of what was going on um, these um, uh, hangouts with uh, you know streaming the video through YouTube um, it seems to be working a bit more solidly but then there are other limitations for example um, we can only have 10 or up to 10 people able to speak in the meeting so we have to be selective about that and uh, so the rest of the people are, are viewing it through YouTube and there is a delay for those people <clears throat> a bit of a lag so they get it there a few few minutes behind when they actually see what's going on live um, so I guess uh, what I'm what I'm asking is uh, are there uh, solutions that other people have come across that uh, could be you know up for consideration for these meetings um, things that are being used elsewhere that you like uh, we could try Um, I guess uh, if if you uh, if you have suggestions, please type them in the, the dev chat and um, or you know comment uh, on the on the uh, the actual developer meeting uh, wiki page um, you know, at some stage in the future, or or send your suggestions to me directly. All right, so, so people are already suggesting something efflux. I'm not sure what that is, but we'll have to check it out. I haven't tried go to meeting. I mean, it would also have to be able to be used without any specific software requirements, and it'd have to be cross-platform, obviously. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, if, yeah, guys. So, um, it, yeah, really, um, what we're interested in is something that can handle a large group of people. We're talking between 50 and 100, um, and maybe even more because we're getting a lot of people watching this video afterwards. Um, something that can be recorded and something that can allow screen. if we have something that more people can participate in. Have I gone quiet for you, Dan? Can anyone else hear me? Not critical. Okay, fabulous. All right, well, um, yeah, so a couple of suggestions there I'll follow up on, and if there's more um, smoke signals could work. Um, yeah. Please, please keep going, suggesting things. All right, there were some questions at the bottom of the agenda. Um, should we go through these one at a time? Martin, did you want to read through those? If you had f dot lux, you wouldn't have this problem. Uh, I don't know what it is. There's something's just cutting, <laughs> cutting you off. Is it the government? Blame the government. Damn government. Um, yes. Yeah, well, the NSA are better than that, I think. 
anyway, um, so thanks. Well, I think we covered that pretty much. Uh, so <sighs> keep your eyes open, everyone. That's all. And if you see something, please just let Michael know. And uh, you know. I, ideally, if we could have open source, I would love it. Uh, a big blue button maybe just needs a bit of work um, to make to help it. Uh, it's so close. I actually think its interface is perfect. It's just the quality is not quite hanging in there. Um, okay, uh, those last questions on the, the list. Um, so, um, let me share this. Which I haven't really looked at. Uh, okay, so um, what are the plans in 2.7 for gradebook improvements? Um, there is a big discussion in the forums about that. Um, there was a bunch of a bunch of smaller things have happened already. Um, just was mentioned today in our own uh, HQ chat um, about uh, more interface type improvements. Uh, have already landed, um, but in terms of larger things, there's three main uh, things going on that I know of, and we need to do a big project to bring them all together. And it's not going to be in 2.7; it'll be probably 2.8. Uh, so the three things that are happening are one: there is a project among a bunch of universities in Australia who are looking at gradebook stuff with NetSpot and uh, they came up with a, um, a load of improvements that they're going to develop and throw back towards core. Most of them are all plug-in type things and they're, they're non-controversial, quite nice interface fixes, um, but fairly light, more interface stuff. The second group is uh, Louisiana State University, obviously in the USA, and Robert Russo and over the years, he's been hacking away at Gradebook and has come up with lots of interface fixes and changes and stuff um, that a lot of people are already using in production and is quite well well regarded. Uh, so there is all that. It's not clear yet how much of that works for people outside the US. It's not clear uh, how good the code is um, in terms of you know uh, unit tests and all the things for integration. So there's that. Uh, and the third one is uh, that uh, Peta finally um, put to paper, or rather in the, the chat, um, some ideas for the gradebook, which are much more core type things, re a bit of a refactor of stuff. Um, and if you're interested in that, then I suggest you go and read it. Um, there is a Moodle, there is a tracker issue, 25423, uh, but this is the page in the, um, uh, in the Moodle docs that's covering it. So have a read about that. It's too much to summarize it all now, but um, all of those things kind of we're going to have to take all together, I think, and have a big gradebook project at some point soon because it's getting urgent, um, but it's not going to be in this release at all. I'll just check the chat in case I missed something. Uh, Tim, do they have an epic for it in the tracker? Uh, there are issues for it. Ah, yes, well, yes. So Peta, uh, the thing I just attribute to Peta, David uh, Mudrak came up with a lot of that too. Um, I believe they have, Tim. Um, I will do a quick search. And try and find it. Uh, so here is the uh, here's the chat in the uh, Moodle forums, and I thought there was an issue for that. I think there's some issues mentioned in amongst this chat, but offhand I don't know exactly where it is, but. Look there, I'm pretty sure you've already seen that. 
Um, yeah, we'll add them add them later. Uh, okay. Next thing here, uh, will the base theme no longer receive updates or be actively worked on? I don't know who asked that. Um, but yes, I mean it is being sort of phased out. It's it's really deprecated. Uh, it's being kept there obviously for long term support and a lot of themes are based on base. Um, so it will get bug fixes I imagine, but uh, it's not going to be getting a lot of love. Um, as we, we're moving to bootstrap for the uh, the new main framework. Um, at some point base might go away in some future version. That's not clear when that will be. Um, it, when I say go away, it might become an option or uh, option to install or something, but there's no harm in keeping it. Uh, the I mean, once you start, just a bit more on that, once you start using a clean theme or a bootstrap theme, uh, it's pretty hard to go back to the old themes. I think you'll all agree. Um, so it really is uh, the way for the future. Uh, any more changes to the event system? Um, I think Raj pretty much covered that. Um, maybe someone wants to, maybe you want to cut in there from HQ. As far as I know, no changes apart from extensions, and there was one rename of something uh, from a, there was some field called level, which is a reserved word in SQL. I think it's been changed to edu level. Oh, was there another one, Dan? Can someone else cover that question? So no one's going to cover the question. All right. Well, I think that's. I must have answered it. So there was a someone in the chat said there was uh, one other small change, but there's no other major changes expected. The event system is pretty much was set in stone in 2.6, and it's just a matter of extending it. Uh, what's the next page? Uh, global search. Now that's an interesting one. Um, I put that. I think I saw Thomas here before. Tom has. Mirek, uh, global two. Let me just add that to this window I'm sharing. So um, this is the issue for that, and the code has been written, and it has now been in the backlog, now put in the backlog of the back end team for review, because well, it needs to be reviewed. I haven't. Um, Personally, I have no idea about the code at all, uh, and I haven't even seen it running yet. So, quite keen to have a play with it. There's a demo there. Um, so, but uh, it, it looks like it's really made a lot of progress. So, I'm pretty happy to see that. Uh, that's global search. Um, so um, I, I hope the uh, back-end team will get to it in this uh, in this cycle very soon. Um, of course, they are dealing with a lot of logging and events right now. Uh, and that's it for the list. I saw a question a bit further up here from Sam about namespaces. Uh, I um, I guess that's uh, yeah. Has that been answered in the chat? This is going to be really weird because I'm reading off chat and res responding and it's really out of sync. So I don't know, hopefully it'll make sense in the end. Um, but uh, Tim's saying there is no mention of the events changes in the 2.6 release notes. I find that hard to believe. Um, 
almost certainly it's there. If it's not there, that is a terrible, terrible oversight. Um, Well, the second one, there's a new events infrastructure. Um, true, it could be a lot clearer than it is. Um, but it is at least there. Um, yeah, no, agreed, that probably should have been more highlighted. Um, yeah, so there's the link to the docs. Uh, well, there is these docs, I guess. There is a section here on migration, but uh, is it covered? Not really. No, it probably should be. A Moodle site bug would be great, Tim. Thank you. Yes, no, it should be. It should be right there on the front page, Moodle dev docs page. Um, Speaking of which, actually, uh, this page, although slightly wanting, um, is going to be the, really the main page for developers, the starting page. So um, if there's things that uh, need to be added here, then please suggest them. Um, but we are going to have to give a bit of an overhaul here. Um, you'll see on the new Moodle.org page, which Maybe you haven't already seen it yet, uh, which looks a bit like this. Um, so the, the new Moodle.org homepage has a, a bunch of things and uh, links and uh, has some forum stuff being surfaced out to the front page. It's very language aware and so on. But at the top here we have a sidebar and this sidebar points to the major sites that we have um, and not without some thought. So the development link here goes to that developer homepage on Moodle Docs as the front page of development. And um, the color of development is this sort of uh, bluey purple color. So you'll see that there's sort of highlighting on all the developer stuff. It'll all be bluish. Um, so the tracker also will have some blue tinting and, uh, and uh, the development stuff. Translations are sort of a red, middle.net's just kind of bright orange. The demos are gray, the downloads are green, and so on. Documentation's purple. Um, so yeah, everything's going to be a bit color coded. So all our developer stuff will be this nice sort of a bluey color, and um, it will be uh, pretty nifty. But Kashi, yeah, maybe you hadn't seen the new page yet. It's still being ref it's not, not quite ready for production, but soon, we hope. Uh, and at the same time, Moodle.org is moving to a server in Germany, um, which should hopefully make it more stable. It's a bunch of rambling from me. Uh, any other questions to talk about before we close up? It's been two hours. Um, well, I guess not. Um, the good thing is that the conversation is an end. Uh, so please come into the dev chat here anytime. Uh, if you're there already, then you know you belong there. Um, so uh, we'll um, keep on talking. And thanks very much for all your various work on Moodle. Um, those of you in the Hangout, want to say any final words? Michael? Anything I've forgotten? No, HQ? Michael? Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. I'll have notes and uh, yeah, all sorts of chat log and we'll have the recording up on this, uh, on the developer meeting, on the wiki tomorrow morning sometime. Cool. Uh, well, thanks all. Cheers. Have a lovely day or night, wherever you are, and um, thank you. See you later. Bye.